The next one is off ball. And this gets us back to Anthony Davis, who, if you haven't listened to it, I did a greatest off ball players episode trying to just focus on the offensive value guys bring without their kind of like on ball game. If we had to strip that away, I think Davis, one of the great off ball players ever and one of the great off, maybe, maybe the best uh, off ball big of all time, because you're looking for skills like offensive rebounding, uh, you know, finishing at the rim with lobs, pick and roll partnership, but then also pick and pop ability. Um, he moves very well and flashes to spots in the mid range, gets moves in transition like this, can back cut and can hit the three and can fade to the three, can go from being a screener to, sh- to a shooter. Uh, a huge number uh, percentage of kind of his shots have been assisted over the years. You might not notice that unless you watch him a lot or know that data. But I think the key to this is that it's rare. This is a very rare skill set because to kind of fit in this category, you have to have some kind of inside-outside combination game. I I think a historical example of this would be someone like Kevin Garnett, where you've got post skills and you're big and you can do other things, but you also have an outside shot and maybe you're comfortable handling and passing. I think it's a very rare kind of category um if you want to feather someone in who's a little bit more realistic maybe like Kristaps Porzingis right now it's <laughs> I ironically his nickname is the unicorn because he's a 7-3 dude who can you know put it on the deck and dunk on you and then also hit threes so make of that what you will about how realistic this archetype is but I do think this is kind of its own archetype from what we'll t- what we've been talking about and where we'll land on the final category. One thing to really note, though, as is the case with a lot of off-ball greatness, uh, y- it's less about floor raising. It's You're, you're going to see less of a, hey, let's build our offense around this guy and have these incredible regular season results, and more of what I think you saw in New Orleans with Anthony Davis, which is, okay, things are good, but they don't jump off the page. Now, I said this before I said this in my top 10 video last year when talking about his case for the best player in the league last season. But, I mean, he's, these guys still can do solid jobs in floor-raising situations because of this level of talent. Anthony Davis last year in New Orleans, on the court, they had a 115 offensive rating. And they outscored people by almost four points per 100. In Los Angeles... In the regular season, when he played with LeBron James, 114 offensive rating. When LeBron James was off the court, 111 offensive rating. So there's kind of the classic example. If you don't construct the roster in any incredibly meaningful way around him, uh, when you kind of just put him out there by himself with, uh, let's say, random parts or semi-random parts, you, 111 offensive rating, that's, that's right around league average. That's okay. But at this point, we do have to question the difference between the regular season and then the ability for this to um, become more valuable in a way in the playoffs. In 173 playoff minutes as of recording this, a small sample alert, definitely a small sample. But uh, Los Angeles with a 122 offensive rating with Anthony Davis on the court and LeBron James off the court. And AD's numbers have been fantastic in that stretch. 32 points per 75 on 68% true shooting. There's some luck to that. His mid-range shot right now is in the mid to high 50s. I just, I don't think that's sustainable at all. Uh, I do think it's, we can buy that he's improved his mid-range shot and that he's a good mid-range shooter. But those are just off the charts numbers. If you bring them back down even to 45% on these mid-range shots, Uh, He'd be like 29 points per 75 on 62% true shooting. The offense, in theory, just from those shots alone, would go down to about 118, 119 offensive rating. So still great stuff, but in a very small sample. The thing that jumps out to me is the offensive rebounding. Six offensive rebounds per 100. That's a huge number. And he's shooting 80% at the rim in the postseason. Again, these are small samples, but that one's more sustainable to me because that one is a reflection of him 
just destroying smaller teams or teams that are ill-equipped to handle his balance of speed, athleticism, cutting, and size. I actually think this was a thing in last night's game against the Heat game two where they were still playing a tremendous amount of zone against the Lakers. And then you have Davis coming in, grabbing offensive rebounds, and mm, let's say certain commentators then criticize the effort of the Heat team. And I don't think that's it at all. Instead, you can you can there's a number of instances you can see it on film. Kendrick Nunn, if he's the low guy on the block, and Davis roams into his area in the zone, that's just a mismatch. It's going to take a lot of work for Nunn to make sure he keeps AD off the glass in those situations. And yeah, when he roots down like that, uh, just his entire athletic package has made it really difficult for teams. So that is more sustainable to me. And Porzingis' numbers, by the way, also very good just in terms of his combination of spacing, pick and pop, and then a little bit with the same thing on putbacks or his size at the hoop. He doesn't have a great post game. In fact, you could argue he has kind of a weak post game for his size. But I think he's another one of these sort of like off ball big men that you integrate into high level offenses really well as key pieces. With Luka Doncic, a 118 offensive rating. It's Porzingis and Doncic on the court in the regular season when they were both off, by the way, the Mavs still had a 114 offensive rating. I've talked about how good their bench can be and basically the way Carlisle has them playing. He's just a fantastic coach. Just a fantastic coach. But Christoph Porzingis on the court in those minutes without Luka Doncic this year also had a 118 offensive rating. And this comes out in our PIPM filter where when we look at the performance against these top defenses only in the last two seasons, he's 22nd in the whole league, plus 2.7. So these guys, Anthony Davis, 18th, plus 3.2. So not only do these guys have a lot of value, but I think there's a lot of signals saying they're really, really good. And whether you want to think about traditionally building around them in the heliocentric way, yeah, that might be okay. But I think... The way I'm looking at this is if I'm trying to construct a high-level championship offense, these big men are a key part of the attack. Sure, I can only have great perimeter players and fill out my roster that way and think about my offense-defense trade-offs that way, but this is the modern game. If I can get big men who can protect the rim, not get smoked on the perimeter, and in the case of AD, you know he's the real unicorn here. Guard wings, guard bigs. Played, you know, I can put him in zone, I can put him in rim protection, I can switch, I can not switch. Um, Having this kind of offensive package for a big man is huge. Thanks for listening. You can find the full episode of this Thinking Basketball podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy podcasts.